Facebook, and on um, YouTube. And so uh, hopefully this is going to work. And like I said, I got two phones, so I'm not sure where to look. So if you see me looking off this way or that way, I'm looking at both phones. Anyway, um, good to have you here this morning. And we're going to start with a couple of songs. And then I got some specific prayer requests that I want to pray with you guys before we get into the word this morning. So we're going to start, my daughter's here, we're going to start with this song, Oceans. from Revelation where they're sitting around the throne room just praising God. And can you imagine what that day is going to be like when we are all in heaven and we're seated around the throne room? And it's, if you can picture it, I don't know if you can, but it's an antiphonal call response where the angels are singing and we're singing and it's going back and forth. 
and all of heaven is resounding with that noise. But here's the thing, that's not just on Sunday mornings, it's continuous. And I, you know, sometimes I think, wow, can we continue to sing like that? Well, I think when you think about God and all of his glory in Jesus Christ, you have to sing. You're gonna just be compelled to worship continuously. And so it's not like we're sitting on a cloud just playing a harp and sitting around. We're actively engaged with God moment by moment. And that's, that's just an awesome thought. So we're trying to duplicate that in some small way this morning as we sing this song, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, Revelation song. song says who's the king of your heart so this song is just about Jesus being the king of our heart the place where we run to when we're in time of need and that's all of us right now I think so uh, let's sing this song together <laughs> Yeah. 
we got one more song talking about God's holiness and lifting up holy hands. But before we do that, I just want to pray for a moment. We have some special prayer requests. You, of course, all of you know, especially if you're in town, we've been faced with fires all over California, but especially in, in our area, we were just kind of surrounded by the fires. And praise God that, um, you know, I was on my way home and um, from a, a funeral, I flew in late last night and I was gonna go home this morning, but uh, the last report I got was that it was still smoky and I uh, wasn't sure that we could get into High and Palm because we have a service there as well. And we got the report today that everything is open now. All the road closures are done with. Uh, so apparently we're out of imminent danger. Um, and so I'll be heading back there uh, um, at the first of this week. But even though for now our town is safe, it's burning throughout California. And uh, they're still experiencing a lot of smoke there. And so I ask you to continue to pray for uh, the whole Trinity County area and Shasta County and the bordering counties of Tehama. Um, th this fire is just, these fires, there's more than one, they're just raging out of control. And as I said last week, I'll, I'm not a prophet. I'm not forecasting that this is part of God's judgment. Um, I don't know if it is or not. It might just be the circumstances uh, that we're facing, but I will tell you this. I am feeling very strongly that our nation needs to repent and, and God needs to turn his, we need to turn our hearts back towards him so that he might continue to bless this great country because we have been greatly blessed, Lord, uh, and we just haven't, um, we haven't honored him in the same way. And so I just ask you to join me to pray for our country, pray for our leaders, pray for our citizens, that we would turn our hearts back to God and pray that God would send rain. You know, Elijah prayed and it says, a righteous man who prays, you know, availeth much. And, and Elijah prayed and it rained. In fact, it rained so much that it, it just <laughs> kind of was a torrential downfall. And, they, and uh, so we're praying that God would send the rain and quelch these fires. But, but more importantly, that, that he would rain down his blessings on us, uh, on America. You know, there's so much we're facing right now. I think of our, uh, the people who are caught in Afghanistan who haven't been able to get out, and Americans whose lives are threatened, and already people who have lost their lives. Many of our Christian brothers and sisters who, who weren't able to make it out of there, and of course, several of our soldiers who died uh, risking their life for those who were there. And uh, so just lift that up. And also just this very special prayer request for uh, a fellow pastor of mine, um, Keith, Pastor Keith Wright, who uh, this week um, was taken to Mercy Hospital uh, with COVID. And um, anyway, it's a, I, I called him on the phone and he seems to be doing a whole lot better, uh, but you could tell he was breathing, uh, he had breathing difficulty. And so just continue to lift him up and, and his family. Uh, uh, and for some reason too, uh, we haven't had to worry too much about COVID in our county, but, uh, but the count is up right now, and uh, it seems like there's a, a lot going around in Hayfork right now, maybe due to the fact that there's a lot of people coming into the area. And so um, just pray uh, for this pandemic, pray for our community uh, specifically, if you would. Um, pray for the smoke to go away. And uh, other prayers, just prayers for the church around the world, uh, as you know. Christians are putting their life on the line today that we're we're kind of countercultural and our message is not being received by the world in some areas and so um, many Christians are being persecuted in fact I, I found out that you know as many people as many Christians who suffered persecution in that first century that in our own century there's been more persecution now in our time than there ever has been in the history of the church so please continue to lift up our persecuted brothers and sisters. And so right now, would you just join me as I pray for our country? I pray for Keith, uh, other prayer requests. Uh, and, and please feel free that if you're watching, um, I won't get them right now. But if you have something you want me to pray about, please send me your prayer request. I'm happy to, uh, to go before the Lord on your behalf and pray. Um, so let's pray just for a moment. Lord, I want to thank you. 
that you always welcome us to come into your presence, that you're always standing by, that you never sleep or slumber, but you're continuously watching over us. And we can bring our prayers to you, Lord, knowing that not only do you hear us, but that you do something about it, that you respond to prayer. We lift up our our country right now. We especially lift up the state of California because there's fires burning all over the state and even up into Oregon, Lord, and um, even into Canada. And so just uh, fires in, in North America right now. And so I pray that you would extinguish those flames, Lord, that uh, the fires would be put out, that you would send rain, Lord, and that uh, you would also send us your grace and your mercy, Lord. I pray that your people, people who name the name of Jesus Christ, would, would just uh, have a posture of repentance and pray to you, Lord, and just ask you to, you say in Second Chronicles, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that you will hear from heaven and you will forgive us and you will heal our land. And we know our land desperately needs healing right now, Lord. We need your special touch. And I do believe there was a time when, when you had special favor on America and other countries were looking to us as kind of a moral compass and that's not the case anymore, Lord. And, and so we repent of that as a nation. And I pray that you'll put it in the hearts of our leaders and especially in the, in the hearts of our Christian leaders to take a stand together, stand in unity and, and pray for your mercy and your grace to be abundant, Lord. And that your church and, and just others around the world would repent, Lord, and turn their hearts back to you, Lord, that you might relent Scripture tells us that when we repent, you relent and you turn away your judgment. And so if we're feeling your judgment right now, which I believe we are, Lord, we're just praying for your mercy and your grace. And again, we wanna lift up our brothers and sisters around the world, the persecuted church, people who are putting their faith on the line moment by moment, uh, who are sharing the gospel and people are responding, that's the good news, but at the same time, the really difficult news is that many are jeopardizing their lives and risking their freedom to preach the gospel. So we stand with them, Lord, this morning. And we just, again, ask you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. And we thank you ahead of time for loving us and for blessing us so richly. And so we just set aside these next moments as we pray and we look in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Filled with 
with his glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. And it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. Yes, it's rising. and we acknowledge your presence with us here today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, can you get my iPad? Um, well, it's good to be with you again and as we start this morning, I just want to remind you that we have been preaching kind of a series on the Word of God um, and um, in particular, the, what we call the pillars or the marks of being a disciple. Oh, it's over there. Um, and the, the idea that there's really four pillars that we build on. One is the pillar of worship, which we just did. And, and worship isn't, isn't just singing. Thank you. It's, it's more than music. It involves our prayer. It, it involves um, our reflection, all of that. It's just pouring out our hearts to a loving God, worshiping Him for not only what He's done for us, but for who He is. And so uh, that's one of the first pillars, it's worship. And then there's uh, the instruction in God's word. There's the Bible, which we've been talking about for the last several weeks. And uh, we're gonna continue to talk about that today. Then there's the idea of fellowship. And, and as I said before, fellowship is much more than just hanging out and having coffee and donuts. You can't really have fellowship unless you're talking about Jesus. You see, the world out there can't have fellowship. They can have great get-togethers, they can have great parties, but they can't have fellowship because fellowship, by definition, is our relationship with Christ and with one another, and the two are linked together. And, and so that's what, what we want to be about is, is our church fellowship and body life together. That's why we pray for one another. That's why we gather in person to worship. The Bible says, don't forsake worshiping together or gathering together. And, and I especially wanna tell that to our Facebook family, those who can't go to church right now. I don't know what reason, you may not be able to go to church and I don't know what all those reasons are. But if you haven't been for a while and there is a church in your area that you can go to and, and get involved and do ministry and, and just enjoy the body life together, I encourage you to do that because it makes a difference not only for you, but when you don't go, you are robbing the church of your giftedness and your ministry. So I just encourage you to get involved somewhere. Don't just sit and watch at home on television. I know some of you need to do that because of the pandemic or for health reasons or whatever, but I just really wanna encourage you to find a, a good local church. And if you don't have one and you're in the Hayfork area, then I'll tell you what, come to our church. We'd love to see you there on Sunday mornings at, at 11 o'clock and hopefully next week we'll be back on our normal schedule. The other thing too, part of our fellowship is having weekly Bible studies and we're so anxious to get those started again. We have a great time. We eat a lot of good food. We do a lot of laughing, do a lot of singing and we just share in God's word. So I hope you'll join us for that time and we'll be able to get that started pretty soon. And the last one, which we're gonna talk about next week is evangelism because it's one thing to take in the word of God, but, but you know, we need to also 
take that word out and, and, and just kind of be a light to the world around us. That's what Jesus said. You're a light on a hill and no one hides that light under a bushel. And so we're supposed to share that light with others because we're Jesus Christ. We're his reflectors. He's the source of that light. But we have the awesome advantage of taking that light to the world around us. And so we'll talk more about that in the next couple of sessions. And then, Lord willing, we might move on. I'm thinking of moving on to the book of Revelation because there's a lot of people who have questions about the end times. I have questions about end times, so I'm studying it right now and trying to get a handle on that. But hopefully that's the next direction we'll go in the coming weeks. Um, not next week, but in future weeks. So that's kind of where we are uh, right now. Today, I want to talk more about the Word again. But if you recall, when we started talking about the Word of God, I'm going to turn this way now, say hi to you guys. Um, as we talked about the Word of God, you remember that uh, we talked about, first of all, the nature of Revelation. And that's so important because when we talk about Revelation, we're talking about God who He Himself has revealed Himself to us. And, and the really great thing about that is because God has revealed himself to us, we don't have to guess about what he's truly like. He's told us who he is through his word. And so our his revelation does away with man's speculation. Because I'll tell you this, every time you speculate about what God is like, you'll probably come up wrong. And so we need to listen to his word because through his word, he has revealed himself to us. And ultimately, that ultimate revelation is Jesus Christ, his son. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about that, that God has spoken at various times in various ways throughout history, but in these last times, he has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the ultimate revelation. And so if you're listening today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you know what? You don't really know God as you need to know him because you know God through his son. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so he is the ultimate revelation. But as we talked about revelation, we also talked about what I call the eyes of scripture. The first one we talked about was inspiration. And that's the idea that the Bible isn't just any ordinary book, it's inspired. And that word inspired refers to actually the breath of God. He has breathed his very life into, into his words. And, and it's the Holy Spirit who works through his word to bring about the second eye, which we called illumination. Illumination is, is about our understanding. And uh, revelation gives us the content of what God has talked about. Illumination gives us that deeper understanding because left to ourselves, it'd be very difficult to really understand God's word, not because it's complicated, but because it's so deep and so rich and our finite, man, our finite minds cannot comprehend a God who's so awesome. And so we need the Holy Spirit to turn on the light and, and give us understanding about those things in Scripture. So that's the doctrine of illumination. So there's inspiration, there's illumination, but then there's also the doctrine of inerrancy or infallibility. And we spent quite a bit of time on that, that not only is the Bible God's revealed word, but because it's God's word, it's infallible, it's trustworthy, it's reliable. And we made special note to talk about the fact that there's some churches today that are saying the Bible contains the word of God. I'll tell you what, that's one of the most damnable heresies out there because what that leads to is the idea that since it only contains the word of God, we have to decide what parts of the Bible are inspired and what's not inspired. So guess what? You get to pick and choose what to believe and not to believe. And that is so wrong, people. It is so wrong. We need to read the Bible for all it's worth. And we need to mine its treasures with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, re recognizing that it is infallible. It is trustworthy in everything that it teaches. It's useful for training and righteousness, the Bible says. And so that's important. But the, the last I we're going to talk about today, and that has to do with interpretation, or you could say instruction. Because uh, here's the question, since it is, is the revelation of God, how do we go about understanding that? How do we interpret that? 
And uh, I just reminded of what Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, was talking about. He said, we need to read scripture for all that it's worth. So what he was talking about was reading all of the Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, all of it, because all of it represents God's revelation. And we need to mind that for all that it's worth. Okay. So we want to talk about that. And there's a couple of passages I want to start with this morning. One of them is Proverbs 30, 5 to 6. If you have your Bible, turn there. And I'm going to read it for you right now. But here's what it says in Proverbs 30, verses 5 to 6. It says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Just a few simple verses there, but boy, they're packed with meaning because notice that here he's talking about two things. He's talking about both a promise and a warning. What is the promise? The promise is that God's word is true. It's reliable. You can trust in it and you read it and, and take it in. That idea that the word of God proves true refers to the fact that it is perfect or flawless. Some, some translations use the word flawless. And in these verses, it's interesting that that word flawless is a word in Hebrew, uh, which literally means it's a word sarap, which means purified or refined. And it refers to when they would refine gold or metal and in that refining process, remove the impurities. And some of you know that story of the goldsmith and the refiner's fire and the idea that in old times when they would refine the gold, they would keep on skimming off the dross that would rise to the surface. And you knew when the gold was as pure as it could be because you would gaze down and you would see the reflection, your own reflection in the gold. And that's such a beautiful picture because in God's refining word, He's taken away the impurities and he's making us more like his son. So when we look into that gold, into that refined gold, what we're looking at is our faith that's been refined by fire and by the word of God. We look at that and we behold the face of Christ. We see his reflection, not ours, as we're becoming more like him. And that's what the word of God does. So I like to think of it like this. When we read the Bible, we're mining it for all of its treasures. But what the word of God is doing for us, it's refining us. We're mining, it's refining. And it's not just rhyming there. I'm not just rhyming and I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Uh, the, the whole idea that the, that process is going on, our effort to reach in and, and mine the Bible for all of its riches and then it refining us and giving us purity. It's, I was just about to take a sip there, thank you. Anyway, uh, so that's that's what that whole idea is about. But don't ignore the warning in that passage too, that we must be careful not to add or subtract from his word because it is his revelation. We don't have the right to change it or, or adapt it. We can adapt it, but we don't have any right to change it in any way or modify it. That warning is repeated again, you know, in several places, especially in the book of Revelation, where it warns us not to add anything to the book of this prophecy. And it's not just talking about the book of Revelation. It's talking about the entire Bible. Because there's a warning there that if you want to avoid God's judgment, then you obey his word. Don't mess with it. Okay? I hope that's really, really clear. But the second verse I want to refer you to is just a very short verse that's found in 2 Timothy. And most of you know this verse and I've referred to it a couple of times during this, this uh, series on the Bible. And it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Rightly handling the word of truth. That has several things we need to pay attention to. One, he's telling young Timothy who was going to take over for him in, I believe it was Ephesus. He left him there to take over the church. 
And he wanted to make sure that even though Timothy was young, that he was studying scripture for all that it was worth and rightfully handling the scripture. So he didn't want it just to give it a glance. He wanted Timothy to study it. Okay. But also, notice he talks about being an approved worker. Some of you have been in churches before that have the Awana program. And the Awana program is based on this verse. The word Awana is an acronym that stands for approved workers are not ashamed. And it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, program uh, and, and it reflects this passage well. I, I do want to make one statement though uh, that has to do with what I want to talk about more today. And it is this. Scripture memory is so important. Okay, it really is. And the Awana program is based on that. But I found that there's something sometimes lacking in the Awana program, and it's not the program itself. There is nothing wrong with that program, a wonderful program. It has helped so many children establish them and get them rooted in the faith. But here's the problem. Sometimes the way that program has been administered in churches, they emphasize scripture memory without the kids really understanding what they're reading. And sometimes they're memorizing verses in isolation, removed from their context. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But can you imagine memorizing all this scripture and then not even understanding what the Word of God says, right? So we need to make sure that we're, we're not just memorizing scripture. You know, all of us have our favorite verses, you know, and uh, our family had a family verse, a life verse, Proverbs uh, 3, 5 to 6, I think it was, you know. Um, that um, help me out. Uh, lean not on your own understanding, right? Um, but, in all your ways. but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And that was such an important scripture for our family. But here's the thing: sometimes when people say they have a life verse, they've removed that verse from its context, and they apply it for everything in their life, not understanding where that verse came from. And it's important that, that we understand the larger context of God's word and understand that we don't just look at these verses in isolation, but we try to understand what did they mean when they wrote these verses? What did the person who, who wrote this, what did they mean? And we're gonna talk a lot about that today. And so um, that's just a, a little caveat to think about. But what I wanna start today with is to give you a word and it's a big word, but don't let it alarm you. It's a word you've probably heard, and especially if someone just graduated from Bible college or seminary, they're gonna throw around this word because it sounds like a cool word. It's the word hermeneutic, and that's not the name of another Bible student, you know, hermeneutic. No, it refers specifically to the art of interpretation. And I'm gonna tell you where we got that because it comes from a Greek word, which basically means to interpret or explain. And that word actually only occurs in the Bible one time, in the New Testament, in Luke 24, 27. And if you remember, when Jesus was resurrected, he appeared on the road to, uh, to Emmaus with, these, um, with the two disciples, and they were talking about the resurrection. And Jesus appeared among them, was walking with them, and uh, they were talking about his resurrection and all the events that had happened in Jerusalem over the last week or so. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? And they kind of rebuked him and said, where have you been? Don't you know what's going on? But it says that he explained the scriptures to them. It says, I'm beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things pertaining to himself or concerning himself. So Jesus used the Old Testament and he interpreted it. He, that's the word hermeneun. Um, the, the idea too from, from that word actually comes from, do you remember in, in the book of Acts when the apostle Paul in Acts 14, Paul healed a crippled man at, at Lystra and um, Barnabas was with him, and they thought that the gods were visiting them. And so since Paul was the main speaker, they called him Hermes, because um, he was the chief speaker. 
that's where we get the word hermeneutic because that speaker is related to the idea of speaking and interpreting. And so they saw Paul as the Hermes or the interpreter. So that's where we get that idea of hermeneutics. So that's a little history lesson just for your edification. Now you can go to your Bible studies and tell them all about hermeneutics. Okay. Uh, but I want to read to you something from, uh, do you know where that red binder went? Um, I, years ago, I don't have time to really go into the whole issue of hermeneutics. It's a study all in itself. And I really recommend <clears throat> that you get a good book on how to interpret the Bible. Or if you can, if you've got a local Bible class and you can sign up for a course in hermeneutics, it will do you so much good because it's so important to know how to rightly interpret the Bible. <clears throat> and Robert Stein, who was my <clears throat> teacher in hermeneutics, wrote a book on this. And I just want to read a little bit from the opening chapter of his book because this is such a common thing that we do. And so <clears throat> I want to use this as kind of a lead-in to talk about biblical interpretation. So just uh, listen as I read this, this uh, kind of this little short story to you. It says, Tuesday night had arrived. Dan and Charlene had invited several of their neighbors to the Bible study and now... They were wondering if they would come. Several had agreed to come, but others had not committed themselves. But at 8 o'clock p.m., beyond all their wildest hopes, all those who had been invited arrived. After some introduction, uh, introductions and neighborhood chatter, they all sat down in the living room. After some introductions, Dan explained that he and his wife would like to do, would, would like to do was to read through a book of the Bible and discuss the material with one another. He suggested that they read the book, the Gospel of Mark, because it was the shortest book in the New Testament uh, of the Gospels. And they all agreed, but everyone sat around kind of nervously wondering what to do because none of them really had read the Bible very much, nor did they know how to interpret it. But Dan reassured him, you know, no one here is a theologian. And they would work together in trying to understand the Bible. They went around the room noting by verse Mark 1, 1 to 15. And because of some of the different translations used, the National, International, New International Version, Revised Standard Version, King James, etc., <clears throat> Dan sought to reassure everyone that although they were reading from the various translations and it might be slightly different, they all meant the same thing. Um, after thinking for a few minutes, they began to share their thoughts. Sally was the first to speak. After thinking for a few minutes, she said, um, what this passage means to me, now catch that, what this passage means to me, what this passage means to me is that everyone needs to be baptized, and I believe that it should be by immersion. Well, John responded, that's not what I think it means. I think it means that everyone needs to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Ralph asked somewhat confusedly, I'm not exactly sure as to what I should be doing. Should I try to understand what Jesus meant or what John the Baptist was thinking or what the passage means to me? Good question, right? I think it means that everybody, he said, um, he was told by Dan that what was important was that the passage, what the passage meant to him personally. Encouraged by this, Ralph replied, well, what it means to me is that when you really want to meet God, you need to go out in the wilderness, just as John the Baptist and Jesus did. Life is too busy and hectic. You have to get away and commune with nature. I have a friend who says that to experience God, you have to get in time, in tune with the rocks. Now think about that. Haven't we had that experience where we're in a Bible study and people go around the room and they're all kind of, just saying what it means to them. And, and sometimes what that sounds like uh, is not pulling the resources, but pulling our ignorance, right? Because we're all just kind of giving what we're getting out of that particular Bible study. But is that what the passage means? No, that's not what the passage means. Because what we're gonna argue today uh, from the rules of hermeneutics is that uh, a passage only means one thing but there are numerous applications. 
And so we're going to talk about the difference between meaning and significance. And hermeneutics, the art of interpretation, how do I get to the true meaning of the text, right? So we want to talk about that briefly this morning. And we won't exhaust this. Again, it would take up an entire course and, and probably weeks, if not months, to go through all that's involved in biblical interpretation. But what that doesn't mean is that you can't get a good handle on the Bible. By following a few simple rules and guidelines, you can mine the Bible for all that it's worth. Okay, So um, let me start by the three components of communication. Okay, And the three components are the author, the text, and the reader. <clears throat> that may seem kind of obvious. Linguists call it something different. They say the encoder, the code, and the decoder. Still others will say there's the sender, there's the message, and the receiver. For our purposes, we're going to talk about uh, the author, the text, and the reader. And the question becomes this. Who ultimately is the author and where does meaning come from? And now, now we know, based on the doctrine of inspiration, who the author is, right? The author is God. He is the source behind all of this. But he has chosen to use human authors who, again, remember, were speaking to their particular situation, using their own personalities, their own words, their own vocabulary to speak about these things and yet guided by the Holy Spirit so that when they wrote these things, it was exactly what God wanted to communicate. That's the mystery of inspiration, the wonderful mystery of inspiration, okay? Um, so there are these human authors, but just like any author, we need to know what the author meant. And obviously, some people will say, well, the meaning is found in the author. Others will say, no, no, it's just in the text. Still others say, no, it's the reader who determines what something means. Just like in the earlier example of everyone going around the room, what does this mean to you? Well, what's the answer? What's the answer? The answer is that I want to argue this morning that the answer is the meaning is found in what the author willed, what the author willed. Now, that may seem kind of weird, but all we're saying is that the author knew what he was writing, and he knew what he meant. Let me ask you this question. If you write a letter, say a love letter, to your wife, or you write a letter to your children, and you tell them all about your life, and then maybe you get personal and share some things, maybe some of that lovey-dovey stuff, right? And, and then you pass away, and years later, someone finds that letter. They may have a different idea of what you meant, but you know what you meant, didn't you, when you wrote that letter? You had something in mind. And the art of interpretation is trying to get at what did the author mean, okay? And so meaning is found in the author. Let me give you an example of this, and some of you have heard this example. I've used it numerous times, and my family's going to be tired of hearing this example, so I'll give you another one in a second. But, um, you know... You might remember the song American Pie by Don McLean. And um, in fact, I just I found out I was talking to a friend of mine in our church, Jim Andrews, and it turns out his cousin is Don McLean. So I guess we have a celebrity in our church, <clears throat> or at least uh, a relative of a celebrity, which is the next best thing, right? Uh, but Don McLean wrote this song, American Pie. And if you remember the song, it's a song about the day the music died, so bye-bye, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. You remember that song, right? Some of you who are a little bit older, the kids of the 70s. Well, what's interesting is there's several lines in that, in that song. One of the lines is it talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They took the last train for the coast. The day the music died, right? And... And it was funny because when that song came out, there were people who were writing just volumes and volumes trying to interpret that song, trying to figure out what did Don McLean, what was the hidden meaning of that song? What was it really about? And I remember hearing one person who wrote quite a bit about it, and he was kind of one of these musicologists who studies music as an art form, and he, he was you know kind of pontificating and saying, well, obviously, what this refers to is the movement of music as it went from England and then to the East Coast first and then migrated to the West Coast 
and it changed the whole dynamic of rock and roll music as we know it today. And he's just talking about all this stuff. And uh, later on in an interview, they interviewed Don McLean and they said, well, are you ever going to tell us what these words to this song means? And uh, his basic answer at that time was, hey, I was just rhyming stuff. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to me, you know, they're reading in all this meaning into that uh, and not really knowing what it meant because they didn't know what he intended, right? Um, maybe a better example, go back to our own history, which is repeating itself today, back to the early 1980s and into the 1990s. You might remember that um, they were getting ready to uh, confirm the nominations for Robert Bork and Clarence Thomas as Supreme Court justices. And during those hearings, one of the main issues was trying to determine whether you should interpret the Constitution based on what the original framers, our forefathers, intended, or whether it was, uh, so what was the original intent of that document, or whether it should be interpreted based on the culture of the day. In other words, was it a fixed document where the meaning was fixed, not to be altered or changed, except through constitutional amendment? Or was it a fluid document that was designed to change with the times? Well, I think you know what happened in our culture. It's kind of become more in vogue, depending on who's in office, to think about interpretation of the Constitution as being very fluid. But I would argue that it had an intended meaning when the framers of our Constitution framed those words. They thought very carefully about how they wanted to form our country. And they wrote the Constitution in accordance with that idea. And so <clears throat> they never intended for it to be just randomly interpreted or just to change and be fluid and however any state wanted to adopt or interpret it on their own or, or even individual judges leave it to, to their subjectivity to try to interpret what it meant. And can you see some of the problems we have today because of the way people interpret the Constitution and how it's affecting our nation today? Well, now take that illustration and bring that to the Bible. What happens when people determine their own interpretation of the Bible? What you get is something called eisegesis. There's exegesis, which means drawing the meaning out of the text. So you're finding the author's original intent. What did he mean to say? But a lot of people practice eisegesis where they read into the text. I want the Bible to agree with what I already believe. How many of you have met Christians, and maybe you've done this yourself, where you're reading the Bible, and there's things that you don't agree with. You go, oh, I don't believe that. That couldn't be part of God's inspired word. Thomas Jefferson was like that. There's a translation of the Bible, not a translation, but they found Thomas Jefferson's Bible. And you know, he was a man of faith, but there were things he didn't like in the Bible. He began to rip them out of his Bible. And when he was done, he had a very small Bible. And I don't recommend you do that. But even if you don't do that to your Bible, some of us do that in our minds where we just, we just reject portions of scripture because we don't think it applies to us or it shouldn't apply to us because it doesn't agree with our lifestyle where we want to go. So that's why biblical interpretation is so important because the author knew what he meant and we need to get at that meaning because God is behind the author, right? Well, what about the reader? Well, again, if you believe that the reader is interpreter of the text, then what will you do? You'll read into the text and you'll, you'll look for those things that appeal to you. And the Bible will mean just what you want it to mean. And you'll miss the meaning of what God intended. Okay, I would add this. To deny that the author is a determiner of meaning is kind of not only uh, will lead you to wrong interpretations, but it's kind of... of um, kind of a, a slam on the author's creation, right? And, and you can see what I mean by that. Can, can you imagine someone talking to a songwriter, like maybe 
Paul McCartney or John Lennon if he was alive and to tell him something like this. You know, I love that song that you wrote, I Want to Hold Your Hand. But you know, based on today's culture, didn't you know that holding hands wasn't going to be enough? No, no, we live in a very sexual culture and so you should have written the song differently and maybe that's a poor example, but, but that's letting culture uh, invade the author's creation and trying to determine what it should be about rather than what it is about, okay? And again, that's, that's probably a terrible idea, but the idea is we don't have a right to mess with someone else's creation, whether it be a song, a painting, a poem, we don't have the right to just change that. In fact, we have laws against that, copyright laws that don't allow us to do that, right? How much more dangerous is it to change what God has said? To read meaning into something that he never meant? Because if it's bad enough to mess with someone's creation, what about the creator himself? The creator of all things, we better watch out for that. So let me really quickly give you a, full, a few rules of interpretation and then give you some negative examples a couple of mistakes that I've made, and uh, I know. Just go back and forth, I like get two people in your audience. It's hard. My wife is telling me to keep looking camera to camera, but I feel like I'm going, whoop, whoop. anyway. So, if we have a light, like they do on television screens, that light lights up and you go, oh, turn this way. So I'll try to remember that. Um, anyway, there's a rules of interpretation because the Bible is a written document Okay, so we can treat it somewhat like we treat other literature. There's rules of how we interpret literature. And I want to tell you what some of those rules are. Because if you apply this to your Bible study, you're going to get so much more out of it. And again, these, these, these are just guidelines, okay? And it's not the whole way to interpret Scripture. But these are some general principles. So if you have a pen, you might want to write some of these down, okay? And if you don't have a pen, just rewatch this part of the broadcast. And, or again, get a good book on biblical interpretation and you'll see some of these in there. The first thing is interpret a passage in the light of its context. You see, context is everything, right? And, and we've all had that experience, haven't we? Where, where, where we're talking to someone and they report something we said, wait a minute, you took that out of context. That's not what I meant. And we'll talk more about context in a minute, but context determines the meaning of a passage, not just the words, okay? It's, but also, the second thing is, it is important to know the correct meaning of the words. You know, remember the Bible was originally written in three languages, Hebrew, and then it has some Aramaic terms, which is a form of Hebrew, and Koine Greek in the New Testament. And so, if you look at those languages, they have nuances of meaning. That's why it's important when you're learning to read the Bible. When, when, when a, someone goes to Bible college or seminary, oftentimes we study the original languages because even though we have great translations today, we want to study the subtle nuances of that language because meanings of words can change according to the context. But we need to know what the correct meaning of those words are especially as they come back into our translations in, in English. We also need to look at the grammar, right? Like the verbs, is this a, a command? You know, um, is it, uh, you know, what, what kind of form of grammar is it? Are we talking about the, the nouns, the mood? Uh, are we talking about past tense, present tense? All those things, we need to look at the grammar to help us interpret the structure of a sentence. Uh, we need to, what we just talked about, look at a passage according to the author's plan and purpose. And that's where we need to dig in and see um, what he was dealing with, which, which a lot of that has to do with the background. What was the historical setting when he was writing? What was the occasion? Who was he talking to? You know, a lot of the passages that we look at today that we claim for promises for ourselves, have you ever realized that a lot of those are passages dealing with Israel? And yet they might in a general way apply to us, but there's some specific passages that have to do with Israel and especially in light of Israel coming back into the land during after the tribulation during the period of the millennium. And so a lot of those passages are dealing specifically with Israel. It helps to interpret them if we understand that. Okay, now That has to do with the cultural, geographical, historical background of a passage. 
And I'll talk a little bit about that, about a mistake I made in just a minute. But also, you interpret the Bible as a whole because the Bible will tend to interpret itself. Especially, that's why knowing who the author is is important because what Paul says in Romans, he might say something similar in the book of Galatians, right? And so we look at all of those writings of the same author because there's going to be consistent themes. If you look in the Gospel of John and, and the epistles of John, you're going to see themes of light and darkness come out quite a bit. That's really helpful when you're reading the Bible and you recognize, okay, so John likes to talk about light and darkness in a spiritual sense. What is that all about? Okay, so it's important. And, and then um, the last thing is we need to look at the genre. What do I mean by that? Well, literature has different forms, right? There's prophetic literature. There's parables. There's biblical narratives which are telling a story. There's poetry, Psalms and Proverbs. There's wisdom literature. All different genres and all of them have unique ways of interpreting them. That's why, again, get yourself a good, good book on, on interpretation. But uh, as we think about that, let me give you just a couple illustrations of some mistakes that I've made or that I've seen other people make and then we're gonna close for today. Um, and and uh, we're gonna move on to evangelism next week. But I think this is important for you to understand. So let me just cover this really quickly. The first one has to do with context. And, and again, you've heard people talk a lot about this, taking a passage out of context. And as I said earlier, we often do this when we memorize scripture because we look at a scripture, we go, oh, wow, I really like what that says. But we remove it from its context. And sometimes we really lose the, the intent of the meaning and the deeper, more powerful application of that. Uh, let me give you an example of that. This is a pet peeve of mine. It's one of the verses is Philippians 4.13. And it, this is a great, wonderful passage. And it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Great, great, wonderful verse. But I've had that verse, I've heard that verse misapplied so many times. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I worked with uh, a couple of different groups, one with athletes and action, and the other was the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And both those groups really latched onto this verse for athletics. Uh, and, and the way they would apply it, you know, you'd see some, some young Christian and they'd say, well, tell us about the game. And he would talk about his life verse. He goes, well, I just think about Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And they say, well, yeah, you had a little bit of trouble today, didn't you? Because when you were going out on the field, you know, I mean, you were working with a sprained ankle. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, but you know what? I just claimed that verse that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. So I just pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I went out there and I played hard. And I, 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 I'm feeling it right now, but I played hard because I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And you listen to that and you get the idea, you get a couple of wrong ideas. Number one, you, you get the idea that Jesus really cared a lot about who won that game, right? <laughs> like he was playing sides and you wonder, what team was praying harder? Which team was gonna win? And, and, and Jesus also obviously cares a lot about that guy's injury, which he probably does, okay? But that passage has been removed from its context. What's the context? I'll tell you what the context is. The context is Paul is in prison. He's facing his own death. And, and he's written to his fellow disciples, and uh, it might, I don't know if it's this letter in, in Philippians, but later on in, in Ephesians, another prison epistle, he asked for the parchments to be brought to him. The most important thing is, is the word of God because he wants comfort. He, he says, bring my cloak, but also bring the parchments, right? And here, what was the all things Paul was, was referring to? Well, Paul was chained between two prison guards right? And so guess what he's doing? As he's chained between them, he literally has a captive audience. Now, I don't know if I have a captive audience today or not, but Paul did because they couldn't get away from him. And guess what he did? He talked about Jesus as he was chained between them. They couldn't get away. A four-hour shift listening to Paul go on and on about scripture. You think it's hard listening to me for half an hour or 45 minutes? Sit there with Paul, right? And I'm sure he was fascinating to listen to, right? But here's the thing. 
That was in the context of all his trials and suffering. And what he was saying in the all things I can do, all things with Christ who strengthens me, what he was telling us the disciples is, I'm in prison. I'm facing my own imminent death. But I still have the strength given to me from Christ to do his work. Not about winning a game. It's about winning at life. It's about, I can still be victorious in my Christian life and make a kingdom impact even though I'm here in prison because I can do all those things through Christ because it's Christ who strengthens me. So you see how that interpretation is different? Not that it's vastly different or, or wrong, but people start to apply these scriptures to very specific situations and they miss the larger application. But let me tell you something else that I did that involves these other rules of interpretation. One of them had to do with the idea of knowing what genre you're, you're talking about and knowing things like how often a word occurs and the meaning of words and the context especially. What's the historical setting? What was the occasion for this teaching? Who was the person who's, who's writing this? Who were they talking to at the time? And so I was in Bible college and I got a chance to preach my very first sermon. And again, some of you heard this story. Too bad, you're going to hear it again because it's an important application. <clears throat> but I was reading from Luke 15, one of my favorite passages. And it's a parable uh, about the prodigal son. First mistake I made was looking at the parable through my own eyes and not through the eyes of Jesus. Because if you look at that passage in Luke 15, it appears at first to be three separate parables because it starts with Jesus talking about lost sheep. And then it talks about a woman who loses a coin and scours the house and when she finds it, she celebrates. And then it ends with a parable about two sons where the younger one goes off and wastes his inheritance on riotous living. All right. And that's the part of the parable that appealed to me. So I skipped the first two, all right? Because it spoke to me, you know? It talks about this son who goes off and, and screws up his life and he comes to the point where it says he came to himself and he, he rehearses his speech where he's gonna go home to his father and say, I'm not worthy to be your, your son, but I'll be a slave and I'll work for you. And I read that parable and it really spoke to my heart. So I decided I wanted to preach on it but I preached on a subject matter, right? And I ignored the genre. This is a parable. Now, why is that important? In a biblical narrative, you can ask certain questions. Like, you know, when Paul is on Mars Hill and he's talking about the unknown God, you can ask yourself, I wonder what Paul was thinking when he talked about that. That's legitimate source of inquiry because we're talking about a person in a particular situation and what was Paul facing and what was he thinking? How did he feel as he processed all of that? That's a legitimate course of study. You can't do that in a parable. So when you ask, I wonder how the younger son was feeling when he was there with the, with the pigs eating the, the food that the, even the pigs wouldn't eat, you know? You ask that question, I wonder how he felt. And I've heard people go around the room and talk about that or talk about the older brother, you know? What was that like to be in that situation? But I can tell you exactly what that younger son was feeling. He wasn't feeling anything because he didn't exist. You see, in a parable, you make up the characters to fit your purpose. Why was the older, why was the older son in the field? Because that's where Jesus put him in the story. And it fits in for a very important reason. All right? And I focused on the younger son and about forgiveness and about wanting to come back home. That's the subject matter, but that isn't why Jesus told the parable at all. And I had a wonderful, uh, you know what alliteration is where you use the letters of, of what you're talking about to, uh, to talk about your sermon? And I had a wonderful alliteration. I was using all R's, I think, if I recall correctly. It was... Uh, so this young son was rebellious. And then he lived a life of revelry. But then he realized his mistake. And when he came back to the father, there was wonderful reunion and restoration. And I thought, boy, this preaches so well. 
And then years later, I took a course on biblical interpretation. I go, boy, I missed the whole thing. Because you know what I failed to take it to, into account? Is that a parable, you also look for the characters that have a dialogue. And that's the internal dialogue of what the younger son is thinking. But the actual dialogue occurs between the father and the older son who's in the field when the older son refers to, refuses to go to the celebration. And so, um, as you look at that, I, I didn't even look at that. And I also didn't look at the beginning of the parable. Because at the beginning of the parable, you know how it starts? It says, and Jesus told them this parable. And it was in response to, he came and was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees came and saw Jesus eating with them and said, why is this man eating with tax collectors and sinners? And then it says, and so Jesus told them this parable. So now you find out why Jesus told the parable. Compare that the beginning of the story to the end of the story and who Jesus is talking to. And you recognize that what this is all about is the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, by the way, knew that Jesus was talking about them. And they got real uncomfortable, okay? Because Jesus, this was an indictment against the religious leaders. Yeah, it was talking about forgiveness, but what, what it was really about is, you know, here I am, I come and eat with these sinners, and you guys are worried about who I'm eating with, but you're like the older brother who refused to come into the party. All these prostitutes and sinners are gaining the kingdom before you, and you guys are the ones who know the scriptures and should know better, but you're so busy keeping people out that you haven't opened your hearts to receive them into the kingdom. That's really what the parable is about. About hardening our hearts and not celebrating because the line that is repeated is there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who don't need to repent. Who thought they didn't need to repent? Those religious leaders. You see my point? And so we can get off on our interpretation if we don't carefully study what we're looking at. What kind of, are we dealing with a, a parable? Are we dealing with a narrative? Are we dealing with a poem or prophetic literature or wisdom literature? We need to know in order to interpret properly. So hopefully all of that is helpful to you this morning. I'm gonna end there. Um, and so I thank you for joining us this morning. And I just ask you to read your Bible for all it's worth and get if you want to contact me, I can give you some tools that are helpful in your, in your Bible study. But think about that, and you're going to reap so much more benefit out of reading your Bible. And remember to pray. Pray for our church. Pray for our community. Pray for our country right now. Pray that God's going to extinguish these fires. Thank you for joining us today. And I just, uh, just thank you so much. God bless you.